Shalom. Today we're continuing our lessons in the Hebrew alphabet, learning two letters at a time, letter by letter, two by two. Don't forget to get your font chart. Link is below. The first letter we're going to learn today is the kuf. It's the fourth letter from the end. It is different in that it goes below the line. The number value for it is 100. The picture meaning is the sun on the horizon. The sound is k, k, k. The second letter is the Vav. It's the sixth letter of the alphabet. It's a narrow letter. It has a number value of six, and its picture meaning is a nail. So this is interesting because the Vav is used, it's the letter that's used for the conjunction, and it holds things together like a nail. So we have learned three different letters that are very similar. They're just only different in height. Starting from the right, you have the Yud, which is the shortest the Vav, which takes up the full space, and the final Nun, which extends below the line. Incidentally, these three letters together spell a word, Yavan, and that is the name for the country of Greece. Now, reading the Vav can be a little tricky because it represents not only this consonant, V, the V sound, it also represents two different vowels. So if you'd like some practice on that, you can check out this video. I'll put a clickable link below. Together the kuf and the vav make the word kav, and this means a line. So we see in Psalm 19.4, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he sent a tabernacle for the sun. That is, this is a spoken line, a sentence, a line of words, like an actor's line. In 1 Kings 7.23, and he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about. So this is a measuring line. We'll come back to this verse later. Another measuring line in Ezekiel 47.3. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, the waters were to the ankles. From Isaiah 28.10, a verse you probably know, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Again, a spoken word or a written word, a sentence. Joshua 2.21, and she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window a physical thread or piece of cloth. This noun, kav, comes from the verb root kava, which means to wait or to gather. In Genesis 49, 18, I have waited for thy salvation, O Yehovah. In Psalm 25, 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. What's the connection between a measuring line and waiting? When we're waiting, it's as if we're passing different points on a line, but at the end, we have some expectation at the end of that line, at the end of the time of waiting. In Genesis 1, 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. In Jeremiah three seventeen. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Jehovah, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of Jehovah, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. We'll see about the connection to this later. We have learned elsewhere that a mem can be a prefix to make a verb a noun, and this is mikveh. And I suppose you know what this is. It means a gathering of water, but it also means hope. Genesis 1.10 And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. In Leviticus 11.36 Nevertheless, a fountain or pit wherein there is plenty of water shall be clean, but that which touches their carcass shall be unclean. And again, a physical piece of cloth, 1 Kings 10.28. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn, and the king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. Jeremiah 14.8.
O the hope of Yisrael. This is the mikveh. It's different than as we think of the word hope. We'll get to that in a minute. The savior thereof in time of trouble. Why shouldst thou be as a stranger in the land and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? Again in Jeremiah 17, 13. O Yehovah, the hope of Israel, the mikveh, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Yehovah, the fountain of living water. I'm thinking about the time that Yeshua wrote something in the dirt. Tav can also be a prefix for a noun, and this is the word you know for hope, tikva. Ruth 1.12 Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, and she asked the girls, would you wait for them to grow up so they can be your husbands? In Job 14.7, for there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. So even though it looked like at some point the line of Judah, the kingly line of Judah, was cut down like a tree, there was hope for a sprout, a netzer, which we would probably call like a sucker, or a tzemach, a sprout, maybe coming up from an acorn. In Proverbs 11.23, the desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. It's not exactly what he hopes for, but he can expect it at the end of his waiting time. Zechariah 9.12 Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Now we're going to find something interesting when we go back to 1 Kings 7.23. The exact parallel verse for the description of Solomon building the laver is in 2 Chronicles 4.2. And even if you don't read Hebrew, you can go through and see these two verses are exactly the same, except for the words that I have highlighted, which is that word for line. In 1 Kings, it's spelled with a hey, which is an incorrect spelling. And in Chronicles, it's just spelled kufav, which is the correct spelling. Now, why would that be? Well, if you remember, it said that the diameter of the laver was 10 and the circumference was 30. Now, this is bad math because the circumference equals the constant pi times the diameter. Now pi is 3.14159, and so the circumference should actually be 31.4, etc. Now this is speaking of cubits. A cubit is 18 inches, and you're one and a half of them off. You're practically two feet off in the measurement of the circumference. So it seems like I don't know. Is God bad at math? I don't think so. So here's an interesting fact. If you take the 30 that's listed and you times it by the numerical value for the kava with the extra hay, which is 111, and you divide that by the numerical value for the kav, which is 106, check out. You get 31.415. It's very, very accurate. I did not discover this anomaly. I don't even know who did, but it's pretty amazing. It's just sitting there right in the middle of Tanakh, the constant for pi. It's actually hidden some other places also. Now in astronomy, there's a kav, and that's the line that ties the two tails of the fishes of the constellation Pisces. Pisces, one fish is swimming up, the other fish is swimming along. The traditional understanding is that it's the difference between the spiritual man and the earthly man. The spiritual man is going to go. He's going to head towards the heavenlies in a spiritual sense. The other fish is just swimming along in the direction of the world. But they're constantly tied together. That's like maybe two other groups of people. Uh, if you're more interested in this idea, you can check out the video on the month of Adar, the 12th month, which uh, we're coming into this week. So interestingly, in Genesis 48:16, Jacob is blessing Joseph's sons. And he says, The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let thy name be named on them. 
in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. These are Joseph's sons. And you remember the story where Jacob crossed his hands and he blessed Ephraim, the younger, over Manasseh, the older. And Joseph protested, but Jacob said, no, I know what I'm doing and this is what I'm going to do. The interesting thing is that the word for grow into a multitude there is a Hebrew word that only ever appears once, and it comes from the word for fish. They're going to multiply like fish. I'm sure you know that some people use that fish maybe on the back of their car, or they have a necklace or something. It represents the believers in Yeshua. So what is our expectation as we're waiting as we come towards the climax of spiritual history. Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Messiah, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And in 2 Thessalonians 2.1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah and by our gathering together unto him, in Isaiah 2.2, 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Jehovah's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Remember we talked about the gathering. This is our hope. In Revelation 17.15 we see, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, the waters always represent the people. So the hope, which is the mikveh, is the gathering of the waters, the gathering of the people. This is our expectation at the end of the waiting, at the end of the line. Now, we always talk about the counterfeit. The counterfeit of the waiting and the expectation is in the classical timeline. The classical timeline, here's an example of one. It starts at the left, and it goes to the right, and we're just always moving, moving, moving in a direction. There's, there's nowhere to arrive to. There's nowhere we're at the end of time. Things are always predicted to be getting better and better and better. There is one way I know that this is not true. If you don't mind, I'm going to tell you a joke. It's a joke about a cola salesman, and he's assigned the territory of the Middle East, and so he designs this fabulous pictorial representation of the benefits of drinking cola. And here's a man laying dead in the desert. He's just wiped out. And then here he is, he drinks the cola. Oh, and he's up and running. And so he reports back to his superior and his superior said, well, how, how's the uh, ad campaign going? And the salesman said, well, it's terrible. And he explains to him the pictorial essay that he did. And the superior says, wow, that should be great. And then the salesman breaks to him the news. Yeah, but in the Middle East, they start on the right and they read towards the left. And so you see here is a template, a Microsoft template, if you want to make your own history. It's always moving. The arrows are moving, moving. Everything changes from one thing to another. Everything's a milestone. One of the interesting things about this is that in, in ancient Eastern cultures, time was never seen in this fashion. Time was seen in cycles. And if you're studying in Hebrew, it's any amount of time, you know that the concept of cycles is very important. I'm reading from a book which is called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe. It was written in 1997, I want to say some time ago. They are trying to explain about the cycles of history. And so they introduced this book by explaining why people do not see things in cycles anymore. And what's interesting is what I'm going to read you from the book. I'm on page 10. The suppression, that is of the cyclical view of history, dates back to the early Christians who tried to root out calendrical paganism denounced classical cycles, and pushed underground entire branches of nonlinear learning. Only the wicked walk in circles, they quote St. Augustine. And as time, uh, in modern times, of course, this became 
more fiercely attack. So they're trying to bring back the concept of cycle so we can understand you know, where we are in our own cycle in our country or even in the world. But I thought it was quite interesting that it was the early Christians who had pushed out the cyclical concept of time. Another counterfeit we see, uh, if you've been at all to Jerusalem, maybe walking towards the wall, they're all kind of Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, and they're trying to sell you or give, get you to give a donation for a little red string to put around your wrist. Uh, perhaps you've seen some famous people like Madonna or somebody wear these. These are associated with Kabbalah. It's mysticism. It's to ward off the evil eye. We have a mighty God who protects us from all evil. We don't need to be wearing a red string around our wrist. One clue you should get about that is that it's also done in India, land of 300,000 gods. So we reach our memory verse in Psalm 40, verse 1. Kavo kiviti Yehovah. Kavo, this is a case where you need to learn how to read your vavs, okay? This is not a vowel, the vav with the dot in the middle. It's not a vowel. The kuf has a vowel, so the next thing has to be a consonant, and it has its own vowel, that dot on top. Kavo, ki viti, Yehovah. Surely I have waited. I have surely waited for Yehovah. That's it. Until next time, tasimitai nayim, al hashemayim. Keep your eye on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.